we are on. Hello, everybody. I'm Nina, and we are here today to discuss plots on this panel. And um, I have a few questions. And I'm going to have to look down for a while, every once in a while, to, to manage to read them. Um, yeah. My first question would be How would you define a good plot twist or an ending? What does it do and how? Well, I'll go ahead and jump in. Yeah. Um, my name is Sarah Berman, and um, I write fantasy, mostly science fiction. Um, to me, a, a really great plot twist is something that is perfectly logical in hindsight, but isn't where you lead the reader. So you, you have a, an entire story that kind of takes the reader in a specific direction. And in the end, you kind of turn that on its head but when the reader goes back, they can see all of the indications that that's really where you were going. It's just not where you were obviously going. That sounds a bit like an end as well. Sort of. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's I really like to do that. And here comes the Yeah, I like to do that kind of thing too. Um, I've always been fascinated by works where I'm surprised. And um, so I try to work little twists in all along the way and then save one big doozy for the end of, say, a particular book. And then in the terms of the series that I've done, and the third book is coming up pretty soon. It's going to be out in about a month or two. And, and, and big, huge plot twists. And like Sarah said, though, it, there needs to be something to where when you come to that, the reader suddenly realizes, oh, okay, because all those little clues that were so subtle just kind of pile up on you. And if you haven't done that, then the reader really <laughs> feels cheated or maybe even mad about it. But, it, you know, it's almost instantaneous. And I've had a real major plot twist at the end of my first book. And I've had several people tell me, boy, you had me going on that. And I said, well, did you get it right away? He says, oh, yeah, right away I could see. And they went back and they could see it, everything built up. In fact, a lot of them would go back and look for those places just to kind of enjoy how I was playing a little, little subterfuge on them. So I think the flip side is what makes a bad plot twist. So my name is Leslie and uh, Leslie Donaldson. I wrote The Queen's Viper as my first of a trilogy, just finishing up horror today. And um, I'm a child of the 80s. So The Lost Boys was like one of my flagship films. And when Grandpa comes out at the end and says, there's too many effing vampires, I'm like, really? Grandpa, really? And that was the kind of thing that... Uh, doesn't have those subtle cues and that you can go back and say, wow, I didn't see that coming. Because, yeah, you don't see it coming because it's completely fictitious in the sense of, uh, it, that's a deus ex machina, right? It, it's just dumped in there to save the day. So I think that's what a bad plot twist is. It's the flip side of it. That was, um, that was always my feeling when I was um, reading Sherlock Holmes is that he goes through all these little things that no one could ever have got. None of the clues. Yeah. Only he could have got the clues. So even though I enjoy the stories, that no, I think part of a good, you know, finding this topic is, is that the reader can, could maybe have worked it out. There are some clues that can be worked out with this. I have a few, um, I'm Debbie, I'm the author of the Pause series, and I have a few big plot twists and I think towards the end of towards the end of my books and I think people could work it out and so I've had some people say oh I worked that out and I've had some people say no that completely surprised me so and I have one that comes one that's more obvious and one that comes at the end that's really unobvious to a lot of people but still at least I like that there are the clues there that people can get it rather than as I said with something like Sherlock Holmes where it's so devised that you could never actually work it out only he only he would know another another interesting uh, way to do a plot twist is to use the character's personality to inform it instead of having it uh, little clues about what 
the character does. You show it by what he says and the way he, just this interactions with the other characters. And so you drop hints that he's not really as upstanding. Let's say a, um, a hero who turns out to be a villain. You, you don't make him a bastard by his actions until the very end when he turns around and says, and he betrays the hero. You've seen him going along with the hero throughout the book, but he's been dropping clues by what he says, um, even just little hints that show what he's actually thinking about the people or the situations that he's interacting with. Yeah, I, I think a lot of you guys are making a really great point in that you don't want the audience to feel snowballed by it. Right. You know, you, you don't want it to be something that they, you know, it's like, that's cheating them. Mm -hmm. So it's not a good plot twist unless you saw it coming eventually. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be explainable, like, as Sarah said, in hindsight, right? You, ha you have to, you have to realize, like, you might not have seen it. Oh, I didn't see that coming. But then that makes you go back through the book and go, okay, wait, wait, let me just check. Mm -hmm. And when you do, then you realize that it was actually a well-written plot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the best plot twists are the ones that you don't see coming. And then after they happen, you're like, oh, okay, that explains. I mean, like, like, there are a lot of plot twists in movies as well as books and TV shows. And they just seem totally out of the blue. But then when you give it thought, when you read the character's explanation or their the reasons why, then you're like, ah, that makes sense. And that's there are good plot twists that just come out of nowhere, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a really good example of that in a movie is, you know, how how long were people talking about the ending of The Sixth Sense? I told you, I see ten yeah. people. I love that one. <laughs> yeah. So much. That comes. That leads me on to second uh, question number two. Can you give a few examples of plot twists that you have liked in the books you have read as a reader, or films for that matter, and why do you like them? Hmm. <laughs> I'll jump in. One of my favorite and completely unexpected um, is Dean Koontz, the TikTok, which is an older book, so spoiler alert if you haven't read it. Um, just fast forward to the next question, um, or the next person, sorry. Uh, <laughs> this man is being chased by a Vietnamese doll, and the end of who sent the doll after him is somebody you would not entirely expect at all, until you go back to the beginning of the book and you read the first chapter again, and then you go, oh my god, I get it. Mm -hmm. And it, it totally blew me out of the water. The whole thing was like, like where is the supernatural doll coming from? It's that whole like, creepy demon doll thing. And it's Vietnamese, so that was a nice slant. And wow, I really didn't see that, that twist coming at the end. And the end was, skip forward, his mom. She wanted him to get married. And so she sent the demon doll after him to make him marry a nice Vietnamese girl. <laughs> what else, um, first chapter. That yeah, I uh, agree with uh, Sarah on that, on that sixth sense. And on that one, uh, fortunately, I was watching it as a, a video. So then I could rewind back because I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> and when I went back, I noticed that every scene that that actor was in, and now I can't remember his name, the one who was dead but didn't know he was dead. When, who, was, who played Bruce that Willis. Part? Bruce Willis. Yes. Yeah. And every scene he was in, you couldn't see – the other you could only see that person as if they were talking to him but they weren't really like his wife for instance and and you when you go back and look at him you realize she's just there and he's there and it's like they're having a conversation when in fact they're not but it was so brilliantly done and in a book um i'm not i don't think you could quite pull that off uh in a book it would have to be more of a plot detail kind of thing rather than a visual thing and so on, but that's pretty cool. And by the way, I'm RJ Maribal. I forgot to introduce myself earlier, and I write uh, Southwest-based uh, fantasy. Uh, my story takes place in New Mexico, both in the present time and in an alternative time and place that's just like New Mexico, and the series is a real grand parallax series. Next person. Yes. One of the, probably the best plot twist in a book that I've ever read. Spoiler alert for people. This is the 10th book 
of the Malazan Book of the Fallen series by Steven Erickson, the, the main antagonist of the entire nine books before. In this 10th book, you discover that he is the protagonist behind everything. Like, there's a reason he's an antagonist, and the plot twist is that they have to protect him in order to save the world. So the whole time you think, okay, this guy, this character is such a villain, such a bastard, you can't wait for the, the protagonist to get there and kill him. <laughs> and then they can't, they have to protect him. That right there was just blew me away. <laughs> That's great. That, that reminds me of, of one of my favorites. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, that, um, nine minutes now, uh, which is Snape from Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. Where you think he's like evil all the time mm -hmm. through all the books, through all the films, until he actually turns out to be the good guy who tries to save Harry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, let's see. How do you lead up to a plot twist? And how do you end it in a satisfactory way? Well, in, in my book, uh, one of the big twists that I had in the end of the first book, um, I led up to it simply by dropping hints about the behavior and appearance of some of the people in the story. but it. You know, it, it had to be enough that people would remember it later and make the connection, but not so much to draw attention away from the plot. So, you know, I was dealing like with sentence fragments, phrases. Um, I certainly did not have a whole paragraph that was a heavy clue. Um, so that was one of the things, and I had to be real careful on that. And I had also developed a glossary at the end of my story because I have so many different characters and groups of people and places that I thought it would be confusing. It kind of like a Russian novel where you can't remember who all the people are. And so I put this glossary at the end, and then as I was going through the glossary before I sent it off to the publisher for the last time, I realized that I had some way too strong, in fact, I even had some blatant spoilers in there, and I thought, oh, God. So then I went and changed all those and made them very subtle or I took them out completely. So, I mean, I just scrubbed and scrubbed that and all until nothing was obvious, but it was just little teeny bits and pieces. I have a, uh, an overarching plot that I'm doing for my series, Runespell. First book, Too Weird, is out in September. And uh, one of the things that is a huge part of that overarching plot is the identity of the the being who calls himself satan mm. and like there's virtually no hints about it except for like these little details like um at one point he takes a teardrop from the main character's eye and it turns into a piece of amber mm. and it, it's just like this innocuous little thing that she notices but it act, it's actually a really huge clue as to what this being's true identity is. So, subtleties are great. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Anyone else? I find it um, interesting. I've um, taken my, my books, I've done readings in classrooms and things. And sometimes the things, the hints that you think are obvious that people, you know, you think, oh, well, well they're bound to get this. And, they're bound, and oftentimes reviewers and adults get things. Because I write YA and oftentimes kids have told me that they came completely out of the blue this particular plot twist or this particular, when I actually thought, well, you know, they're going to get this, this is going to be too obvious, but it's not necessarily as obvious as you think it is because you're the writer, you've got all the ideas, all the story is laid out for you. Other people, not so, not so much. I'm surprised how much people don't get what, what get and are surprised by the, the plot, by the plot twists in my, in my stories. Well, I think they get, uh, it's not so much they don't get it, but they get wrapped up in the story mm -hmm. yeah. and take it along. And that's wonderful because then our suggestions 
uh, which sometimes are subtle and sometimes not so subtle, mm -hmm. just become part of the fabric of the story. And we are truth tellers as narrators. Mm -hmm. and it's accepted as truth. Okay, so this happens. And there's only weird people like me who sit down and read a book or watch a show and try to figure out the end in the first 15 minutes. I won't name titles right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Leslie, I think you're right, and and it's it's sort of the magician stock and trade to uh, to distract our attention to something else so we don't see what they're really doing, and that's what we're doing. You know, we're playing magic tricks with words and plots and characters and so on. Yeah, it's a beautiful way to put it. Mm -hmm. So, with that having been said, um, there's another question: Are there any plot twists or ending in your works? That are your favorites, and um, that are that you are more satisfied with having written than others. I have uh, a story online that I spontaneously started writing one day on on Twitter. Triple W on Wednesday is Women Writers Wednesday. It was snowing outside. I started writing a story that starts in the snow, and at the end. What happens is not what we expect to happen. There's a sacrifice of children offered in order to placate some entity under the water front. And the twist that I have in the end is 100% not what you expect going through it. You expect people to fight for children, which does happen. And then there's this twist at the end where people are actually submitting to the sacrifice. And the people who are submitting are not the ones that you would expect to submit. So I, that was really neat because I didn't know that was going to happen as I was writing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for us as writers. If we know what's going to happen 100% of the time, it's not surprising to us and it won't be surprising to our readers. We have four minutes now, so quickly, quickly. Okay, I'll just go very quickly. Um, in my story, the, probably the biggest one, and I haven't tested it yet because the book is not out yet. It's the third book in my trilogy. <laughs> but um, it's a plot twist that there are pretty obvious things all through the first two books and the third book that is leading to this. And maybe the only way I'm going to be able to get away with it is I didn't think of that plot twist until much later. And uh, so then I wasn't obviously trying to hide something or make something obvious. It just came out of the story. And um, I'm hoping that when readers come to that, it's like, oh man, it's like one of those where you whack your forehead and it's like like it was so painfully obvious that's what was going to happen and I even have an element of it in cover uh, so I, I'm very interested to see how that one works out excellent now next one we have two and a half minutes um, I have uh, a character that he was supposed to be the bad guy and then um, I decided to go ahead and write his death scene ahead of schedule and the death scene was so different from what I had planned you know I'm sitting there bawling while I'm typing and it was like oh gosh he's not a schmuck he can't be the bad guy oh, no. <laughs> figure out who the real bad guy was and, and so this this uh, subtle character that you know pretty much had a cameo earlier in the book all of a sudden pops up and goes, "Yeah, I'm actually the bad guy, sort of." <laughs> you know, so it it ends up being like this layered bad guy thing. But you know, I had to go back in and put a few additional clues in to make it really work. But it was it was a complete surprise to me because he was supposed to be a schmuck and he wasn't a schmuck. <laughs> Even writers are surprised by plot twists. So, but oh yeah. While. Anyone else? Andy, Debbie. Yeah, I've got I've got one plot twist. Uh, in many ways similar to the one that I loved from the, the Malazan book where the whole time you think one particular character is the, the villain of the piece whereas the, another character that you've been thinking of as the main character's ally, the hunter in the last few Solari series you think that he's this character is very important to the hunter but then at the end of the book, at the sixth book, you find out that the roles between the perceived villain and the perceived protagonist, they're actually reversed. So his, his idea of what each of them were is totally thrown on their head. Debbie? Um, Last words? 
I, it's hard. It's hard because the major, the major plot twists in, in book one, of course, really gave away stuff. So I don't know how to say it without actually giving big spoilers for people who haven't read the book. Oh, but, no, don't ruin it for us. <laughs> well, yeah. maybe you can update next year with those plot twists. There you go. Well, now we have, well, less than a minute. So I think that is goodbye for all of us. Thank you all for being here and being patient. And Thanks. Right. It's finally online. It's great talking to you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Nina. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Nina. Thanks, everyone. Bye, all. Maybe someday we'll all meet in person. I hope so. Bye. Bye.